believe titanium economy companies are not well understood, are not well appreciated, and really hoping to shine a spotlight around what I think is truly this uh, amazing set of companies that drive a lot of innovation and therefore job creation and ultimately uh, are going to be critical to creating a more inclusive economy in the United States. The problem we were really trying to solve is lack of awareness. You look at the industrial sector, it is truly a diamond in the rough. And I would even go further and say it's truly a diamond, maybe not even in the rough. And when you talk to folks, you realize what people believe about the industrial sector and what is reality, there's a huge difference. And so we wanted to fix that perception gap. Growing up, and even I think in the early years of my career, when I thought about the industrial sector, it was not a very rosy picture. At least my personal experience over the last two decades with the industrial sector really is nowhere close to that particular perception. It's been a lot about immense value being added to the companies, to their employees, to the communities, um, and really the heartbeat of an economy. Um, so at least uh, my personal hope of, from this book, we are able to bridge that gap between perception and reality and have folks see the value of the sector. Eighty percent of the titanium economy companies are private, therefore they tend to have a longer term orientation. Uh, but the thing that surprised us was uh, the degree of the high degrees of uh, retention in these companies in the middle of the Great Resignation. And as we looked underneath that, we could understand why the compensation levels are different, they're much higher in these companies. The amount of care and concern for the employees is actually different. People actually get access to different development opportunities. And I think there's a culture, a culture and a purpose that comes from being part of that setup. And I think it's a combination of factors that really brings it all together. So I think the importance of the talent proposition and how well the titanium economy companies have intuitively understood it, not just today, but for the last 50 to 100 years, was one of the things that really struck us. I think two things surprised me the most. Um, I spent almost north of 30 years in the industrial sector, and I knew it's a great sector, but I did not realize how many companies out there were doing so well in the stock market. When Gaurav, who's the co-author of the book, showed me the list, I fell out of my chair. I said, this can't be true. You can't have this many companies who are doing better than S&P 500, who's doing better than NASDAQ 100. And I was like, wow. And I think the second thing which, um, in a lot of ways, provoked us to write the book is, uh, this is not an industry which is dead. We knew it was a good sector, but we went in thinking, oh, this was a sector which was stolen, this was a sector which was given away. This was a sector which was taken away from us. And uh, we realized all of those were false. This was not stolen. This was not taken away. This was not given away. It's a great vibrant sector. It's a sector which creates a lot of jobs, creates a lot of jo livelihoods. And uh, as we talk about it in the book, the best of days are yet to come. Because I thought we were going to be telling a story of the past. Uh, or at least saying, hey, this is our best days. And uh, as we finished the book, we walked away saying, boy, we are in the first innings of the book. We discussed the book with close to about 50 to maybe 70 odd CEOs in the ecosystem. Um, and they all agreed with the messages. And the surprising thing for me was if you agreed with them, then why didn't you act on them? We also talked about how so many of them are private companies, so they're not really uh, worried about quarter over quarter, how investors are looking at them. So that was, I would say, the biggest surprise for me, where the alignment with the key messages of the book, the potential of Titanic economy was pretty widespread. I'm a mechanical engineer by background, but I never practiced mechanical engineering. Uh, I went to business school and then I joined McKinsey directly out of campus. But deep inside me, there's always been a mechanical engineer. And the thing that's always fascinated me is just the level of importance of innovation and how much of that really resides at places that we would not associate with. I saw that in the course of my work at McKinsey I looked at it and said, hey, here's a set of companies that everyone talks about that is known for innovation, and they're great at innovation. I saw software, I saw technology. The thing that surprised me was, here was an equally great set of companies that are great at innovation, that they were manufacturing oriented, yet no one would actually associate innovation with this set of companies. I think the couple of personal experiences which really were transformational in terms of my own thinking about the sector, uh, 
uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer by training. One of my first jobs was being a um, manufacturing manager for a detergent powder factory back in India. The factory was placed actually in a tribal area. The government used to give tax incentives. So my workforce was about 200 people who probably couldn't even write. Uh, and uh, they were coming to the factory daily, producing tons and tons of detergent powder, which was getting distributed all through the country. Um, and that was the first time where I really saw the, I would say, the human value of what a healthy manufacturing organization can do, where 200 people were relying on it for their daily needs. It was a vehicle for social mobility for them. They came from really uh, underprivileged backgrounds. And being able to earn a healthy salary, which put them and gave them a chance to take their families to the next level, take, put their kids through education, give them a proper training and have better lives themselves. So I think that was one of the very first like personal experiences which just transformed my thinking about the industrial sector of what it could do for not just the companies but also a broad swath of people who are involved with that ecosystem. I'm a chemical engineer. I came to this country in 91 uh, and my very first job was for a company called Johnson Matthey. Uh, where I did a lot of work on the manufacturing line. Uh, then I worked for a company called Arlon, which was a printed circuit board shop company. And then I worked for a company called Taconic, which was also in the space. Um, this was the time of Y2K, when everybody was a computer programmer. I believe that I added more value because products were needed. These were real products, real products being shipped, um, people with real livelihoods. And yet, people would not know what Johnson Matthey did, or Arlon did, or Taconic did, and that in a lot of ways provoked me to say, hey, look, it's a great story, it's a great truth, which I think is worthwhile for people to know, and then people can make their own decisions coming out of it, but let's get the facts out there. We talked to about 35 companies, which we have profiled in the book, and we talked to an additional 50 companies, and I believe every one of them is truly an unsung hero on their own merits on the value they have created, the value they have created to the ecosystem, the value they have created to their customers. And uh, as much as I wish I could say it's company A versus company B, all the 35 companies we have profiled in the book and the 50 or odd companies we talk to are unbelievably great companies. If you walk into one of these, the places look clean, the machines are new, uh, the people are working together in teams, the place is inviting. You get the sense that there is something that is much more modern, much more oriented around precision manufacturing, whether it's using new materials, new technologies, uh, different types of equipment. And you also finally get a sense of uh, purpose. Why are, why are these people so excited to be here? It is because they believe that they're driving innovation, that they're doing things that are really important to our future. My dream is that the titanium economy in the United States not only continues to flourish, but continues to accelerate. And making that happen will obviously require uh, individual companies to step up further, right? And in my conversation with CEOs, we're always asking the question, how high is high? How much more innovation could you do? Uh, you know, which other customers could you be serving? Uh, what does it really imply in terms of new products that you can launch? The other part of it is really the enabling factor. It's the role that the government and policy can enable. We don't opine on public policy, uh, and we will stay away from it. But in general, the tenet, the principles of investing in our infrastructure, investing in our people, and finding a way to drive a closer connection between corporate America, especially the titanium economy companies, and the places where talent is available, which is vocational colleges, community colleges, and anything that can enable that will help, will help grow the titanium economy. My hope is that the titanium economy continues to scale, and as it scales, it will continue to drive job creation, it'll continue to drive innovation, it'll drive exports, it'll drive this amplification effect, which is it'll create jobs in adjacent industries, and it'll help local communities thrive. It's also my hope that it becomes more diverse. But more importantly, I hope that the debate shifts. Today, the debate around manufacturing in the US is one that is very pessimistic. It's always with this tinge of, yeah, it is yesterday. And I'm hoping that the debate now shifts to uh, optimism and possibilities, and the fact that it is, it is a future, not yesterday. I've served the sector in my capacity as a partner at McKinsey over the last uh, 12 years. 
And literally in every instance, you could draw a direct correlation between how well a company does and what kind of opportunities does that start affording its own employees. I have my personal examples where, as I have supported my clients into turning into better operational companies, how folks from the front line have done well, who've changed the way they work, have risen in the, in the company and become managers, directors, VPs. So to me, I think that's a great example of the potential which the titanium economy company might offer, not just for, again, the executives, but the employees who are working there in terms of their own social mobility and their social stature. The toughest part of realizing that we'll be addressing the issue of lack of awareness about who these companies really are. These companies are all around us every day, yet we don't actually know them. They don't make the covers of the most important magazines that we read or the newspapers we read or the, or the news channels that we watch. And as a result, over a period of time, they could easily have a talent deficit. People may or may not want to work here. And therefore, part of this is to highlight the purpose, uh, the importance of uh, and the role that these companies really play uh, in, in, our, in our country and therefore find a way to ensure that there's, there's a flow of talent, there's a flow of innovation, and there's a continued focus on enabling these companies to be successful. I think it'll be a true team effort uh, and that the, the key members of the team would be all the executives which are in the industrial ecosystem today who are running these small, mid-cap, large-cap companies, starting from the frontline managers up to the CEOs they have to realize and have to get the urgency of achieving their company's true potential. The first step will be to know what the true potential is, and then second step is creating a path to it. I think the second investors, uh, which need to start thinking about industrial as a good place to start investing, not just purely from an altruistic perspective, but also from a financial perspective. Because if you look at examples in the book, we talk about Heiko is a great one, Trex is a great one. They are real diamonds in the rough who perform better than any index you can come up with over decades. The third member of the team will be the public policy experts, particularly the talent problem and the talent gap which is coming up between supply and demand. And that's where we need some public policy level decisions being taken, which will help close that gap uh, in the coming few years for us. So all these three folks have to put in a team effort over the next few years to make this happen. We've written the book from the standpoint of, believe it or not, a, a student who's actually graduating today and who's considering different choices and saying, where do you want to spend the rest of your career? Do you want to go and work in the services industry that you could? Absolutely, you can do. Or do you instead choose to do something different and come back and say, I actually want to work in manufacturing? The old image of manufacturing, which was around factories that were greasy, that were dirty, uh, all of those doesn't exist. And will this actually start to attract a more diverse set of people to come in and work with these companies. My daughter is 24, and for folks who have a 24-year-old daughter realize that dads are usually not the uh, person who does anything right. Once I walked into her room and she's like, was hiding something, and I said, what are you hiding? And she's like, nothing. And then I realized that she was reading the book, uh, and she was halfway through, and she sort of sheepishly said, you know, this book is not that bad. Uh, and for people who know the father-daughter lingo, that means it's actually pretty good. Which is when it resonated to me is this is a book, um, you know, for pretty much any audience, uh, because it really brings what is the industrial sector to life, right? It's not about pontificating. It is not about victimizing and blaming somebody. It's really talking about what the sector is, what the sector has done, and what the sector could be. Uh, based on facts. In the classical McKinsey fashion, we've used data, and we've used the data to lay out the story, and people can make their own decisions, right? We are not telling people this is the answer. We don't want to tell the answer. We've laid out the facts. Whether you're an investor, whether you're a 24-year-old employee who should be joining the workforce, or you're the CEO of an industrial company, we believe this is a good book for them, for all of them. The titanium economy companies under the radar because they are in some sense everywhere, so you can't find them at a single place. They are private, so you don't find them listed in the stock market. They don't have a business to consumer brands, so they don't have the need to advertise because they typically tend to be smaller in, uh, from the standpoint of revenues 
they don't make the headlines. They don't make the headlines in the news media and everything that they do. So they have, in some sense, they've been going about doing what they're naturally good at, which is really focusing on delivering great returns for their shareholders, taking care of the customers, taking care of the employees, doing the job around communities and uh, cleaning the environment, but have never really found an opportunity to pull it all together and tell the story. It's the same reason why we are excited about this uh, sector as well, because it's not on a technology treadmill. It's not that you see an industrial company coming up and then disappearing in three years or six years and all that. On the flip side, that also has, just candidly brings a sense of complacency that, hey, I'm making 10% margin, 15% margin. That's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad as well. You should, you know, I mean, there's limited reason to complain. So the urgency to change, the need to change, the burning platform necessarily doesn't exist. Um, I think this is where I think we get to the crux of the problem that the narrative, the mindset about the sector overall has to change. It should be less about are we comfortable because we are comfortable. I think it's a very healthy sector even today in the US, but it can be a lot more. What is the true potential of this sector for the country? And, and I have to frame all our discussions through that lens. Industrial sector works hard for the money. They really, every time they've got an improvement is because they have driven a true performance improvement versus getting valued more as we call it the multiples. Um, the analogy is, think about it, if you're buying a house, you buy a house for a dollar per square feet, three days later, three years later, you pay more. It's the same house, you pay more because you pay more dollar per square feet. That's equivalent for a multiple. And industrial is a sector where you continue to pay the same. So you just get more only if you build more house or you make more earnings. And I think that's just because they've not been good storytellers, right? They've not got their message around, they've not got the story about how great they are. And I think Fixing that is going to solve a trillion dollar question, which is creating the trillions of dollars in valuation. One of the other things that struck me is we've been having all this discussion around the energy transition. And I think there's widespread concern about the fact that companies are doing a lot of greenwashing. And I myself was skeptical too. Then I started to look at what these companies are doing. And they're inventing technologies that will actually help with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, many of them uh, take an example of a company like Trex. What they're using is recycled uh, plastics to make outdoor wooden decks today. This is 97% recycled. Uh, you look at other companies like waste management companies that we talked about in the book and that the role that they're playing in terms of using advanced analytics, normally when you throw out the garbage in your, uh, in your house, if you're like me, you're not pretty particularly good at figuring out what is garbage and what should be recycled. And these companies are now using artificial intelligence to actually sort through and figure out how to optimize those. They're not talking much about it, but they're making it happen. The industrial sector is extremely resilient. It's probably one of the very few sectors uh, which is live and let live. Unlike any other sector, I pick retail as an example, or tech as a sector where, you know, if you had companies had a meteoric rise and a meteoric fall, you don't have that. And so I would actually say, which is a greatness of the industrial sector, is very resilient. They make great products, they make great margin, they've been wanted. Um, yeah, they've gone through rough spots, but even through the rough spots, they end up coming out. They're very resilient. Most important lessons is around the importance of recognizing uh, innovation and technology and the fact that we have a very strong foundation in the United States to build from. We've got a set of like 5,000 companies that have really been driving this, not just for the last five to 10 years, but for the last 100 years. And I think the fact that we are still early in that journey and the full potential of what the titanium, the titanium economy over time could perhaps be two or three times the scale of what it is today it could help us uh, create a lot more jobs. It could have the amplification effect we talked about. It will help us when it scales, create a much cleaner planet. It will help us create a more inclusive economy. And my personal hope is it, that also becomes more diverse.